relatively fast drop in progesterone. The endometrium will begin shedding at the day at which it's going to be the lowest, which will be day 28. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here. Today we're going to be going through the menstrual cycle, looking at the hormones and actually what's happening inside the female reproductive tract as those hormones are being released. So to begin, we need to realize that the menstrual cycle is divided into two main sections with two corresponding goals. The first goal of this cycle is to produce a mature follicle or a mature egg. And that will be corresponding with the first 14 days of a 28 day cycle, which we're going to coin the follicular phase. So as you know, the ovaries in the female reproductive system have about two to six million eggs when you are actually born. But those eggs are immature and they need to become matured so that they can be potentially fertilized by a sperm at some point, okay? So once we make that mature egg, the second phase is we actually have to prepare the uterus right here so if that egg is fertilized by sperm, we can actually implant it in the uterus, otherwise known as the womb, so that the baby can begin developing properly. And that is going to be corresponding with the second 14 days, day 14 to 28 of the menstrual cycle, and this is called the luteal phase. So now that we have our goals in mind, let's actually take a peek at the hormones that are going to kickstart this process. Now the hormones that kickstart actually originate in this tiny little pea-sized gland called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland sits at the base of the brain, and if you wanna learn more about it, you can watch this video right here. But this is called the master regulator gland for a reason. And in terms of the female reproductive cycle, at puberty, there are going to be little neurons, which are little signaling cells, that are going to send a signal into the bloodstream of the anterior pituitary, which would kind of look like this. So here we got the neurons sending those hormones into the bloodstream, and these are released at puberty. Now these are called gonadotropin-releasing hormones. Now that is a big, long, scary word, but it basically means that we're going to act on the cells of the pituitary gland to tell them to release their own hormones into the bloodstream, okay? And specifically, we're talking about the gonadotropin. So in this case, the anterior pituitary cells right there are actually going to release the gonadotropins. These gonadotropins are called follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So let's draw what's happening there. So once these releasing hormones get to the anterior pituitary cells, the anterior pituitary cells will be triggered to release, like I said, those two hormones here. And we know that hormones are chemical messengers secreted into the bloodstream, and that bloodstream can go everywhere, including, and very specifically, the ovaries. So we're going to see what's happening at puberty when follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone begin their action on these ovaries. So let's get started. We're gonna take a cross section of the ovaries right about here, and I'm gonna blow it up over on this side of my whiteboard. So we're looking inside the ovary, and we're also looking at the beginning of the fallopian tube, which is this long structure right here. And we are going to begin with the follicular phase, okay? So starting in the follicular phase, you look inside the ovary, and you will see very small cells that are lining the outside of the ovary itself. Now, these cells are called primordial follicles, which literally translates to basically baby egg, okay? And so these baby eggs are just waiting to get stimulated to actually mature, because remember, that's the first goal, is to produce a mature follicle. So you see, all of these eggs can turn into a mature follicle. So at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, we see that follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are beginning to be released. So we're going to show that on my graph from day one to give or take five, we'll have a decent amount of both follicle-stimulating hormone as well as luteinizing hormone. So as those are beginning the menstrual cycle, what are they actually doing inside the ovaries? Well, let's check that out. About 10 to 20 primordial follicles will be stimulated by which hormone, you think? Probably the follicle-stimulating hormone, right? So follicle-stimulating hormone will basically kickstart these primordial follicles to begin maturing. And the way that looks is that these primordial follicles will look something like this now. Okay, so now we see the follicle cell in the center, and on the outside we're beginning to see the development of what's called granulosum cells, or granule cells for short. Now think of the granular cells as just kind of these cells that are going to basically cheer on the follicle to its destination, which is hopefully a mature egg. Now when we're at this stage, these follicles are then called primary follicles. So we've just taken about 10 to 20, going from primordial to now primary because of follicle-stimulating hormone. Now we need to beef them up even more. 
So around days five to give or take 10, now we're only gonna be selective. We're going to take the strongest of the 10 to 20 that have gotten really quite big, and we're gonna turn them from primary follicles into secondary follicles because of the continued release of follicle stimulating hormone. So we'll say give or take two to five of these follicles are selected to turn into what's called now a secondary follicle. And now you begin seeing more cell types. So you still have the granular cells kind of in the center, close to the egg cell itself, but then we also have the development of what's called FECA cells. Now here's where an important thing begins to happen. These FECA cells and granulosome cells are actually going to begin producing a new hormone, and that hormone is called estrogen, which is going to be designated in red. So again, both the granular cells and theca cells are combining to begin to produce estrogen. Okay, well, we haven't really talked about estrogen at this point, but at this day, give or take five to 10, estrogen amount is actually going to be beginning to be secreted. Now, estrogen is going to do two main things. The first thing that estrogen is going to do is going to be still a part of the follicular phase where we're actually going to talk to the secondary follicles themselves. So it'll make actually what's called an autocrine effect. It's affecting itself and it will speed up the development of the secondary follicle. And furthermore, estrogen will also begin traveling over to the uterus. And it's going to almost start goal number two, which is preparing the uterus for implantation of a potentially fertilized egg. Now, what this would look like is in on the inner lining of the uterus, we have a structure called the endometrium, which is literally the inside lining of the uterus. And I like to think of this as the inside meaty part of the uterus. Now, what do I mean by meaty? Well, estrogen, when it goes to the endometrium, is going to begin growing the endometrium so it becomes thicker and thicker. And the reason I drew it in red is because the endometrium, when it gets bulked up, is going to begin to have a very, very big vascular supply of blood. This blood is going to be essential so that if the embryo actually implants into the endometrium, it can begin getting nourished by mother's blood, which will develop into the placenta, which is super cool. So that's very important. It's almost kickstarting that second phase, that second goal. Now, at this point, we have a secondary follicle that is busting out estrogen, follicle stimulating hormone is still stimulating it, and eventually one of these will be selected to turn into what's called a mature or graphene follicle. So this is what the graphene follicle looks like, and you can really see it actually under a microscope. It's a massive thing where you've got that egg cell, a lot of granulosum cells and theca cells surrounding it. So this follicle inside of here is ready to be released or ovulated. Now think about what's happening here. We have so many more granulosum and theca cells, so what hormone do you think is gonna spike? Well, probably estrogen, because these, are, these guys are gonna continue pumping out estrogen like it's its job. So this will happen around day 12 to 13, where estrogen will just begin spiking like crazy. And it'll reach its peak about day 14. Now what's interesting about estrogen here is up until this point, it was staying relatively low, and what I've shown is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are also staying relatively low. But at this point, at just before day 14, so give or take days 12 to 14, what happens is estrogen goes back and talks to, in a way, the anterior pituitary. Because this estrogen is getting in the bloodstream and goes everywhere, including the pituitary gland. Now at this special time in the menstrual cycle, that increase of estrogen makes what's called a positive feedback loop for both follicle stimulating hormone, but especially luteinizing hormone. So all of a sudden, the anterior pituitary starts cranking out a lot, a lot, a lot of luteinizing hormone and a pretty solid amount of follicle stimulating hormone as well, just to give it its last kick before it actually gets released. So we're going to show that on the graph here. So you notice all three hormones here that we've talked about are just spiking like crazy. And that's because this is the shining moment. The egg is, the follicle is prepared and it needs to get, remember, released in the fallopian tube because in reality, the sperm is gonna be swimming up here and it needs to be able to fertilize it somewhere in this region. So at this point of day 14, luteinizing hormone specifically is going to come in and act on some of the cells that are actually connecting the fallopian tubes and the follicle itself. Now notice there's a barrier here of cells in the fallopian tube. Well, luteinizing hormone almost acts like a little shovel. And luteinizing hormone will actually start to break down this barrier, as well as some of the theca cells, so that there's an opening for the egg to quite literally 
crack open and go into the fallopian tube. That's how I always remember it. It's like cracking an egg open and it's being released into the fallopian tube. And that release into the fallopian tube right here is called ovulation. So ovulation occurs at about day 14 of a 28 day menstrual cycle. Wonderful. So check it out. We've just finished the first goal of producing that mature follicle egg. Okay. And now here's the thing. We need to prepare the uterus now for implantation. You saw that estrogen kind of started the job, but if this egg were to implant, if it got fertilized by a sperm, it needs a lot more endometrium to it. So what's going to happen next? Well, now we're into what's called the luteal phase. So why is it called the luteal phase? Well, check this out. When that egg is released, right, we still have a crap ton of cells, both granulosome cells and the fecus cells, but now the follicle has been released. So I'm actually going to erase the follicle itself. And now we have this big empty space, it looks like, but this is actually called the corpus luteum, which literally translates to yellow body because it kind of looks yellow under a microscope. Now, what is the corpus luteum? Well, the cells of the corpus luteum are actually going to shift what they were previously doing. Remember, previously they were releasing estrogen, right? And that caused that spike in estrogen. But what's interesting here is once egg is ovulated, corpus luteum is actually going to switch its production from estrogen, and now it's going to switch it to progesterone. Okay, so now we got progesterone being secreted. So progesterone is going to act very similarly to estrogen, but in a little stronger capacity. Progesterone is going to travel once again to the endometrium lining and begin bulking up the endometrium even more. So when is this going to be happening? Well, it's going to be happening anywhere from day 14 all the way through about day 24 to day 25-ish. So we've got progesterone pretty low throughout the cycle until ovulation occurs, and it's going to spike and stay high until about that day 24, and then we'll talk about what happens next. In the meantime, we also have follicle-stimulating hormone dropping because we don't need to stimulate a follicle anymore. And luteinizing hormone is also going to drop because we've already ovulated the egg. We don't need it high anymore. Furthermore, think about it. The corpus luteum just shifted from estrogen production to progesterone production, so estrogen is also going to drop pretty quick. But then I want to key in on something. We released the follicle into the fallopian tubes, right? But the follicle still has some of those granular cells that are actually going to continue to produce some estrogen. So that, combined with a few cells that are still producing estrogen in these past follicles, is actually going to allow the estrogen amounts to kind of raise during the luteal phase as well until about, like I said, day 24. So all that to say, the key hormones I want you to remember in the luteal phase is progesterone and estrogen being pretty high. Because remember, we're preparing the uterus, the endometrium, for implantation of a potentially fertilized egg. And that's the goal of the luteal phase. Now, let's pause here for a second and think. So if you were to guess, when do you, if you are a female, when do you think you are most fertile? When you're most prepared to actually have your egg fertilized by a sperm? Well, your fertile window falls somewhere in day 14 to day 16. And that's because this follicle you just released doesn't like to stay there very long. In fact, during this time, there's actually going to be cilia on the inner lining of the fallopian tube that are going to begin moving the follicle that direction. And if it falls too far, eventually it could actually get out of the uterus. And that's when we're actually going to shed that follicle. And that's going to be menstruation. So if you want to get pregnant, you want to have intercourse before this fertile window. Because sperm can live for about, give or take, three to five days in the reproductive tract. So anywhere from here, about day 12, to give or take day 16 or so. That way you're preparing yourself for that fertile window. But let's say that no sperm is present. No sperm is present, so that follicle is not going to get fertilized. Well, what's going to happen next? Well, the corpus luteum can only stay intact for so long. Eventually, it kind of gets a little worn out. And it's actually going to begin degenerating at around day 24 to 25. So it'll look kind of shriveled up like this after a while. And once again, that's around day 24 to day 25. And if the corpus luteum is beginning to degenerate, we're actually going to have a relatively fast drop in progesterone. Furthermore, since that follicle is now going to get moved out of the body, and we're not going to have as many granulosum and theca cells anymore, we're also going to have a pretty stark drop in estrogen. Now, at the same time, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone like to just kind of stay chilling. They don't really do a whole lot. The pituitary won't change its secretions during this time. But notice that at this point in the cycle, everything is pretty darn low. The key in on this dip in progesterone, primarily, and a little bit of estrogen. If we drop those hormones, what do you think will happen to the endometrium? 
Well, these hormones existed to build it up, right? So if now we are dropping them, what do you think is going to happen? Well, the endometrium will begin shedding at the day at which it's going to be the lowest, which will be day 28. So here's the thing. If you begin shedding it, quite literally sloughing it off, well, what was inside of here beforehand? A lot of blood supply, right? And that's why we call this menstruation because the body is going to begin basically bleeding because all of the blood vessels in the endometrium are now going to be open to the uterus and begin bleeding down the tract. And key in, that was because of the drop in progesterone and estrogen, alrighty? But wait, that was if the follicle was not fertilized, correct? But what if it, got something in my eye. But what if it was fertilized, okay? Well, in that case, do you think we want the shedding of the endometrium or do you think we need to keep that intact? Well, we'd probably want to keep it intact so that if embryo does get fertilized by, say, a sperm, so sperm comes in here, fertilizes the egg, and now we have formed what's called an embryo. And by the time the embryo actually reaches the endometrium during this fertile window, it actually turns into about, give or take, 16, 32, 64 cells. And the embryo's goal, once it gets to this region, is actually to implant into the endometrium lining so it can begin getting the blood supply, which we'll talk about in a later video. But the goal here then is to continue to keep the blood supply there. So how do you think if we have that fertile window, embryo is made, we need to bury it, but progesterone and estrogen are doomed to drop, right? How do we keep then progesterone and estrogen high so that we can keep the endometrium up? Well, here is where a very important hormone comes in and it's called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, HCG, I am drawing it here, it's being made by the implanted embryo because the implanted embryo will begin developing what's called placental cells. And you've heard of placenta being basically how the baby gets fed. Now, the placental cells begin secreting that HCG. Now, what does HCG mean? Well, HCG, interestingly enough, will feed all the way back, if my marker worked, <laughs> will feed all the way back to a specific structure in the ovary. Which structure in the ovary do you think it's going to act upon? Well, it's going to act upon the corpus luteum. You see, HCG, if it comes back and talks to the corpus luteum, HCG will tell the corpus luteum to stay intact, okay? Because normally corpus luteum degenerated caused that menstruation, right? But HCG talks to corpus luteum and says, yo, 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 we've got a baby here. You need to stay big so that what do you think is going to continue to be secreted? You guessed it, progesterone as well as some estrogens as well. So HCG helps to keep the corpus luteum intact if the placenta begins developing from the implanted embryo. So that once again, progesterone and estrogen stay high. Now, a couple other clinical connections here. HCG is actually what you test for in those urine pregnancy tests. So if you pee on a stick and it says you're pregnant, it's actually testing for levels of HCG. Because if HCG is present, we know that baby is implanted, which is super cool. Furthermore, HCG, regrettably, also causes the faded symptom of morning sickness. Because think about it. HCG wasn't even secreted until you get pregnant for the first time. And so all of a sudden your body has this hormone inside of it and it doesn't know what to do with it. It's just like, what is this new chemical that's coursing through my bloodstream? And it causes that nausea, the food aversions and those types of things.